<laughs> How y'all doing? I'm Joshua Wiley, and this video right here is probably uh, one of the most important videos I've done lately. Uh, sort of like my last one about in this in this. Funny how the last video I did for y'all, for those of you who keep up on here, was uh, about Ellen White exposing Pope Francis, the Jesuits, and secret societies, what we call Illuminati, even way back in the 1800s. And this, and 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 explaining that this was the reason why she was labeled a heretic, uh, a cult, Satan worshiper, only because. She exposed them. Now, the Catholic Church has a history of anyone who opposes against her, uh, they have a history of labeling them as heretic or devil worship or cult. That's what they do. And that's why they, they burn millions of Christians to the stake. And and that's, that brings up one of the reasons why this, this makes this video so important. Because I have a lot of... Uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, a lot of them come on here. They know how I feel about the system because they know they know I feel like we're brothers and sisters. But it's the system, it's the the Catholic Church as a system that I'm speaking against, and the and what it stands for, and the the vows and the things that that it has done. That's what I'm speaking against. But there there are a lot of good-hearted Christians in the Catholic Church. And uh, I have a lot of them who come on here. Uh, I just spent some time not too long going alone discussion with several. But uh, they'll come on here and they'll say, the persecution never happened. And I used to always tell people, well, do your history. You know, Pope John, John Paul, uh, I don't know what number was behind him, but Pope John Paul, he, uh, the one that recently died, he actually apologized for the the Catholic Church, the sins of the church, as he called it, for killing these millions of Christians. And even though he apologized, and the number ranges from 50 million to 200 million, and that's just what's on record. Think about it. Back in the day, back in them times, there was no, they, they didn't have no record. They didn't have no internets and buildings with the Census Bureau and all of that. No, there were a lot of little villages ran through and ransacked. But anyway, even though he apologize for the sins of the church during, for killing these Christians. A lot of uh, good-hearted Catholics and Protestants who uh, don't study their history uh, tend to not believe that these things happen. Well, recently, Pope Francis, Pope Francis came out and he apologized for what the church had done to the Waldenses. He apologized to the Waldenses. And when I heard it, I was blown away. I'm like, wow. For, for, uh, he's a smart pope. You know, I do, uh, I don't believe in him at all, but I do respect my enemies. And I know who is smart. You know, you can always recognize who is smart. But what he, one thing he does know is that a lot of people don't know their history. So when he, Set this apology to the Waldenses. I was blown away because that's a step. What, what, when it's funny, the devil always digs a ditch for himself, and the truth always comes to light. Now, a lot of people don't know who the Waldenses are at all, at all. And the reason why I titled this video Pope Francis calls Tony Palmer a liar. You know, and rest in peace, Tony Palmer. I said that in the last video. I don't know if you're dead or if it was a hoax. I don't know. That ain't what this video is about. But either way, uh, the truth is the truth. Anybody who's seen uh, the video with Kenneth Copeland, Tony Palmer, and Pope Francis, they know that just recently, just recently, uh, Tony Palmer held a big conference with all the evangelical leaders, leaders in the evangelical church, and he uh, declared certain things. Pope Francis' apology to the Waldensi goes against what Tony Palmer said in this meeting. Go totally goes against what he said in this meeting. He stated that we're going to look at just three things. Three things that it goes against. Uh, Tony Palmer first stated that this was Luther's Reformation. 
Now, anybody who knows the history of the Reformation knows that the Protestant Reformation, um, and before I start off, the word Protestant, for because a, a lot of evangelical and Protestants don't know this, even Seminary Adventists don't know this, but the word Protestant means to protest. The word Protestant means to protest Rome. To protest Rome. But anyway, uh, a lot of Protestants who don't know the history, Tony Palmer, he kept stating how this was Luther's Reformation. That Martin Luther started the Reformation. And why is this so key? Well, it's key because the Lutheran church just did something in recent years. What they did was they apologized to the Catholic church for what Martin Luther did. <laughs> and and they said, well, let's come back together. So basically, they they grabbed hands back with Rome. Tight. They, they said, we apologize for Martin Luther. He didn't mean it. He's sorry. And if Luther could hear it, oh, man, there's no words. I ain't going to explain, you know. But they held hands back. Well, let's just say they grabbed hold of, of Rome. And so that's humongous because now he's saying because the Lutherans apologized for Martin Luther and held hands back with Rome that the Reformation is over. And he even said it. He said, aren't we all, uh, if there is no Protestant, then maybe we're all Catholic now. You know, and that's what, it's, it's funny because I, I'll give it to Tony Palmer. He, the way he worded it and stated it was genius. Because those, if you did not know your history, and you were sitting in there, evangelical leader, caught up in the moment, oh, Pope Francis is going to be, I'm so important, I'm here, caught up in the moment. All these evangelical leaders stood up and said, yes, the Protestant Reformation is over, we agree with you, and we're all Catholics now. Hmm. So it may, and the first thing I said when I when I heard that I'm like what come on now anybody who knows their history knows that the Reformation did not start with Luther by far there were so many so many uh, martyrs for the word and early reformers like John Huss John Wycliffe the Morning Star of the Reformation he was deemed the Morning Star of the Reformation. You know, who basically almost handwritten the whole Bible so we could have it, you know. But anyway, these men uh, live way before Martin Luther, live way before Martin Luther. But like I said, Tony Palmer cleverly worded his speech and everything. So the, many of those who don't know their Bible history were like, yes, yes, yes. But anyway, when so when Pope Francis apologized to the Waldensi, it's like, er Everything Tony Palmer said has to be thrown out the window. Thrown out the window. Because out of Pope Francis' own mouth, he has just declared everything Tony Palmer said was a lie. And he also should 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 awaken you to, to study. Well, who is the Waldenses and why are we apologizing? And that's to my Catholic brothers and sisters, and even my Protestant brothers and sisters who say the Catholic Church never killed uh, millions. That's a hoax. That's that's just a lie. That's just a lie. You know, that should open your eyes. Why is he apologizing to this this group of people called the Waldenses? Well, we're gonna get into that in a minute. We're going to get into that in a minute. And, uh, and another thing that he said, he said the Protestant Reformation was based on righteousness by faith. Now, this is a piece, just a piece of Bible doctrine that Luther, that the Holy Spirit used Martin Luther to open up the gates. Uh, his part that he brought into the, the Reformation was uh, opening up people's minds and hearts to what righteousness by faith really is. And that was uh, one of the most important pieces. You know, that was an important piece. I ain't going to say one of the most. Because the whole Reformation was important. And each piece of doctrine that the Lord used holy men to save and to bring to the forefront was important and needed to be brought. But anyway, like Tony Palmer said, he said that the whole Reformation was built on righteousness by faith. Hmm. Well, when the Waldenses who lived hundreds of years before Martin Luther 
you know, hundreds of years before Martin Luther, uh, they were persecuted, martyred, slain, and killed just for having the Bible and Bible alone. So, beloved, to me and to history, through the Waldenses, uh, those martyrs are still telling the story and still holding on the fight. I, I love it. Their blood is still speaking and still carrying on the 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 the, the Reformation. Their their blood is still a Protestant alive and still causing ripple effects even now as I do this as, as I do this vid. Because like I say, their blood uh, foretells that the Reformation, the Protestant reformation these protestants who were protesting rome died for simply having the bible yes i'm telling you and the reason why uh they don't want you to know the truth of what the reformation was really about why because that that, that turns a whole different light oh yes that the the catholic church as a system was attacking any and everyone who had a bible if you had a Bible, you were enemy number one. And not only if you had a Bible, but if you could read it and understand it, you were a marked man, marked woman, marked child. They killed millions of children. But anyway, so this is, was a key point. Like I said, Tony Palmer cleverly worded his whole speech. That's why he, he had to make it known that it was over righteousness by faith was how the Protestant Reformation was started. So when the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church held hands and said, well, we agree on righteousness by faith. Uh, so that meant, oh, because they agree on righteousness by faith, the Reformation is over. Wow. No, why? Because it was over the Bible and it was over those who taught the true Bible and who held, yes, y'all, and, and, and also the people who held to the true Sabbath. So another thing that Pope Francis did in his apologizer to the Waldenses, when you learn about the Waldenses, yes, they were seventh day Sabbath keepers. All of this is factual. Now let's get to the bread and butter. Who are the Waldenses? Who are now? It's 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 no coincidence. It's no coincidence that I said that uh, Ellen G. White exposed Pope Francis and Jesuits. And if y'all watched the last video, I said that it was the great controversy. I'm telling you, if if you want a, a just a purebred history book of Christianity, the untold history, this is the true conspiracy. All of y'all who knows that there's conspiracy out there, I'm telling you, like I said in the last video, there's a reason why they don't want you to read Ellen White, why they want you to think she's a Satanist, even though the, the Satanists themselves are like, she ain't with us. <laughs> you can't find not one of her books in a satanic section and her book and they got satanic and occult sections in all bookstores across America books a million whatever but anyway I almost lost my train of thought but anyway like I said uh it's no coincidence that here I did a video to my how, she, how uh, she exposed Pope Francis and the Jesuits and I stated that was the first place when I read the Great Controversy that was the first place I ever learned what a Jesuit was in a secret society but beloved that's not the only thing I would have never known who Jerome was Huss, John Huss, John Wycliffe and beloved I would have never ever known what a Waldensi was or who they were and what they stood for and why they died. They have cleverly tried to keep these people extinguished from the history books. And if you really aren't sure who the Waldenses are, that's the reason why. And that's the reason why. So when Pope Francis, for whatever reason, apologized to him, oh wow, his apology alone. And he apologized for the church killing millions of them. Or whatever did he say thousands of men I don't know but if, if you know they killed thousands upon thousands of them so if he just says we just killed a thousand him admitting to it is the proof of the pudding itself is the proof of the pudding itself but anyway like I said uh I would have never known who the Waldenses were if I had not read the great controversy and like I said this is my my version don't look at the rip back I need to throw some masking tape on there, but you know, this is the great kind. You see a picture of Martin Luther on the front. They got whoever printed these out, I like them because they actually have good pictures. Now, 
Ellen G. White, yes, and wrote this in the 1800s. This is why, and I, and, I, and, I, and I can't state it enough, this is why they call her a cult, say, Satan worshiper. Did you know, now he's apologizing to the Waldenses, right? But beloved, they called the Waldenses the same thing. All the heretics, well, that's what the main word heretic really, really means. It means opposite of God. If you're opposite of God, if you're teaching, you're Satan. You know, so but this is why they, they always said that the people were heretics or Satan worshippers or wish witches, you know, just like they did Ellen White, Melinda, for just teaching the Bible. And I'm like, Satan worshipper, really? Because she said, don't eat meat, eat vegetables. <laughs> and she taught, but this is the reason why. Wrote this book in the 1800s. And now let's find out who the Waldenses really were. This is why they don't want you to read the great controversy and know who Ellen White is. You tell me what kind of Satan worship. If if she was a Satan worshiper, this is the wackest Satan worshiping book on the market. They don't teach you no rituals, no spells. And it, all it talks about is the Bible and Christian martyrs who died for it. This, this book is a history book of what happened to Christians from AD 70 all the way up to the 19th, to the uh, 21st century. It is a history book of Christianity, the history that they tried to keep hid. And so let's just read, I'm gonna read uh, some, what was written about the Waldenses back in the 1800s. And that's why I say, don't take my word for it, beloved. The truth loves investigation. The truth loves investigation. I'm gonna read what she says, then I'm gonna read a little excerpt from uh, Wikipedia. I'm gonna read a little, and it's funny, cause even Wikipedia states that, uh, they were the forerunners for the Reformation. The forerunners for the Reformation. You know, but like I said, there were many men like John Huss, John White, who died for, uh, to keep the Bible alive way before Martin Luther ever came on the scene. But anyway, I'm just going to read certain excerpts about the Waldenses. Amid the gloom that settled upon the earth during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished. In every age, there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who hallowed the true Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented, or mutilated. Yet they stood firm and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity. As a sacred heritage for the generations to come, the history of God's people during the ages of darkness that followed upon Rome's supremacy is written in heaven. Is written in heaven. But they have little place in human records. Let me say that they have little place in human records. I mean, they are not in our history books. They have little place in human record. Few traces, few traces of their existence can be found, except in the accusations of their persecutors. It was the policy of Rome to obliterate every trace of dissent from her doctrines or decrees. Everything heretical were the persons or writings she sought to destroy. In lands beyond the jurisdiction of Rome, there existed for many centuries bodies of Christians who remain almost wholly free from papal corruption. Now, I'm about to show this picture. I'm going to pause it. I'm going to show this picture that they have of this little Waldensian home. This is an actual home of one of the Waldensies up in the mountains where they hid from persecution. You can see it's up in the mountains of the Alps, tied up the Waldensies. Anyway, let me finish. They were surrounded by heathenism and in the lapse of ages were affected by its errors. But they continued to regard the Bible as the only rule of faith and adhered to many of its truths. These Christians believed in the perpetuity, the continuation. <laughs> Let me put it that way. They believed in the continuation of the law of God and observed the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. Churches that held to this faith and practice existed in Central Africa and among the Armenians of Asia. 
but of those who resisted the encroachments of papal of the papal power, the Waldenses stood foremost. Stood foremost. Yeah. There, its falsehood and corruptions were most steadfast resisted. Was steadfast resisted. For centuries, the churches of Piedmont maintained their independence, but the time came at last when Rome insisted upon their submission. After ineffectual struggles against her tyranny, the leaders of these churches, talking about the, when it says the, the churches of the Piedmont, that's the mountains up in the Alps, at the bottom of the Alps, uh, this is talking about the churches of the Waldenses. The leaders of these churches reluctantly acknowledge, acknowledge the supremacy of the power to which the whole world seemed to pay homage. Some of the church leaders started to give in. There were some, however, there were some, however, who refused to yield to the authority of Pope or Prelate. They were determined to maintain their allegiance to God and to preserve the purity and simplicity of their faith. A separation took place. Those who adhered to the ancient faith now withdrew. Some forsaking their native Alps raised the banner of truth in foreign lands. Others retreated to the secluded glens and rocky fastnesses of the mountains and there preserved their freedom to worship God. The Waldenses were among the first of the peoples of Europe to obtain a translation of the Holy Scriptures. Because remember, like I said, this, this whole thing, the whole Protestant Reformation came about, the whole, you know, this split came because the Catholic Church tried to keep the Bible away from everyone, everyone. And they did this by destroying them and only writing them in Latin and only putting them in Latin because the common people couldn't read Latin. Anyway, hundreds, listen to this, hundreds of years before the Reformation, they possessed the Bible in manuscript in their native tongue. They had the truth unadulterated, and this rendered them the special objects of hatred and persecution. They declared the Church of Rome to be the apostate Babyl Babylonian. I'm sorry. They declared the Church of Rome to be the apostate Babylon of the apocalypse, and at the peril of their lives, they stood up to resist her corruptions. While under the pressure of long continued persecution, some compromised their faith. Little by little, yielding its distinctive principles, others held fast to the truth. Through ages of darkness and apostasy, there were Waldenses who denied the supremacy of Rome, who rejected image worship as idolatry, and who kept the true Sabbath. Under the fiercest tempest of opposition, they maintained their faith. Though gashed by the Savior's spear, the severed spear and scorched by the Roman faggot and scorched by the Roman faggot, they stood unflinchingly for God's word and his honor. And that was mean many of them died by being burned by the stake and persecuted in dungeons and prisons. Behind the lofty bulwarks of the mountains, in all ages, the refuge of persecuted and oppressed, the hiding place up in the mountains. The Waldenses found a hiding place. Here, the light of truth was kept burning amid the darkness of the Middle Ages. Here, for a thousand years, witnesses for the truth maintained the ancient faith. God had provided for his people a sanctuary of awful grandeur, befitting the mighty truths committed to their trust. To those faithful exiles, the mountain were an emblem of the immutable righteousness of Jehovah. They pointed their children to the heights towering above them in unchanging majesty and spoke to them of him of, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning, whose word is, an enduring, is as enduring as the everlasting hills. God had set fast the mountains and girded them with strength. No arm but that of infinite power could move them out of their place. In like manner, he had established his law, the foundation of his government in heaven. And upon earth, 
and upon earth, the foundation of his government in heaven and upon earth. The arm of man might reach his fellow men and destroy their lives, but that arm could as readily uproot the mountains from their foundations and hurl them into the sea as it could change one precept of the law of Jehovah or blot out one of his promises to those who do his will. In their fidelity to his law, God's servants should be as firm as the unchanging hills. Now, I'm going to pause and show you a picture. I got a couple pictures. That's why I like this version of the Great Controversy. A couple actual pictures of how, where the Waldenses lived up in the mountains. You can see how they carved little passages and tunnel ways. Let me see if I can get it to where it focuses. Maybe if I hold it that way. That's one of the areas. And this one right here is inside one of the actual homes. Let me hold it like this. Let me see if I can hold it like this. And that's inside one of the actual homes that's still preserved to this day if you go over there. All right. One more thing to read. One more short little part to read. Now, what they used to do I, uh, and I, that's why I love reading about the Waldenses. What they used to do was they would do, they would they they were strictly about the Bible and Bible only, but they were about evangelism, spreading the word and the message. So what they did up in these mountains, they just went up there hiding and waiting on God to come. But they were studying and they were handwriting the Bible in caves and writing them out in the scriptures. And they would make their children learn large portions of the Bible to memory. They would make them uh, memorize large portions of the Bible and they would write out uh, large portions of the Bible on little pieces of paper and uh, different things, uh, animals, you know, different skins and things of that nature. And they would hide them and they would uh, usually a young man or young woman and a minister, you know, one of the elders would then go down to the city disguising themselves as a merchant or a shoe repairman or whatever and whoever the lord placed upon them to reveal who they really were to they would and they would give them a little portion of scripture or a bible study and things of that nature and many of them were killed and murdered while doing this but they never stopped and that's what we read about right here these co-laborers were not always together, talking about the young person and the elder. They always went out by twos, a young person and an older person, but often met for prayer and counsel, thus strengthening each other in the faith. To have made known the object of their mission would have ensured its defeat. Therefore, they carefully concealed their real character. Every minister possessed a knowledge of some trade or profession, and the missionaries prosecuted their work under a cover of a secular calling. Usually they chose that of a merchant or peddler. They carried silks, jewelry, and other articles at that time not easily purchasable save at distant marts, and they were welcomed as merchants where they would have been spurned as missionaries. All the while their hearts were uplifted to God for wisdom to present a treasure more precious than gold and gems. Now, if they, they just would, they should make a movie about the Waldenses. But anyway, they secretly carried about with them copies of the Bible in whole or in part. Let me let me rephrase that. The right people should make a movie about the Waldenses. I had to rephrase that. In part, and whenever an opportunity was presented, they called the attention of their customers to these manuscripts. Often an interest to read God's word was thus awakened and some portion was gladly left with those who desired to receive it. The work of these missionaries began in the plains and valleys at the foot of their own mountains, but it extended far beyond these limits with naked feet and in garments coarse and travel stained as were those of their master. They passed through great cities and penetrated to distant lands. Everywhere they scattered the precious seed, churches sprang up in their path and the blood of martyrs witnessed for the truth. The day of God will reveal a rich harvest of souls garnered by the labors of these faithful men. Veiled and silent, the word of God was making its way through Christendom and making a glad reception in the homes and hearts of men. In the homes and hearts of men. Now, I'm going to, uh, let me see. 
read what Wikipedia says about about the Waldenses. It's real short. The Waldensians, also known variously as Waldenses, Valenses, Valdesi, or Voudois, are a Christian movement and religious cultural group which appeared first in Lyon and spread in the Cochin Alps in the late 1170s. In the late 1170s. Today, the Waldensian movement is centered on Piedmont in northern Italy, while small communities are also found in southern Italy, Argentina, Germany, the United States, and Uruguay. The movement originated in the late 12th century as the Poor Men of Lions, a band organized by Peter Waldo, that's where the name Waldens from, Peter Waldo, a wealthy merchant who gave away his property around 1173, preaching apostolic poverty as the way to perfection, Waldensian teachings quickly came into conflict with the Roman Catholic Church. By 1215, the Waldensians were declared heretical and subject to intense persecution. The group was nearly annihilated in the 17th century and were confronted with organized and generalized discrimination in the centuries that followed. During the 16th century, the Waldensian leaders embraced the Protestant Reformation. Now look, so the so-called Protestant Reformation that we see in the 16th century. Now, and the Waldensians had been persecuted, fleeing, keeping the Bible alive even before the 12th century. And this is by Wikipedia, so that's hundreds of years before the so-called Reformation even came. But anyway, during the 16th century, Waldensian leaders embraced the Protestant Reformation and joined various local Protestant regional entities. As nearly as 1631, Protestant scholars and Waldensian the theologians themselves began to regard the Waldensians as early forerunners of the Reformation who had maintained the apostolic faith in the faith in the face of Catholic oppression. Modern Waldensians share core tenets with, with Reformed Protestants. For example, oh, let's talk about songs, but anyway. <clears throat> anyway, I had to do this to see that in Pope Francis's apology to the Waldensians, he actually called the movement that he helped form a lie. The, the movement to end the Protestant Reformation. See, his wish is to end the Protestant Reformation. So one of the things he he knew he knows he's trying to do is he's trying to get the remaining Waldenses who's still alive because he has Protestant America, a, a large part of the Protestant America is yes, we're Catholic now. We're Catholic now. And so he now he's trying to clean up and sweep around the board. So the Waldenses who were still alive, teaching what happened, like when uh, a thousand, like twelve hundred of them, got thrown out of this cave up in the Alps. Women and children and men just merc unmercifully just thrown off of this cliff. You know, just for having the Bible. See, he 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 has to go to them who are alive now and say, we apologize for killing thousands and thousands of you and really millions if you look at through all, all the centuries for killing millions of you because he's trying to get them to even come on board because many of them are still saying no so in his one time apology beloved that he has said a mouthful he has said a mouthful that Luther did not start the Reformation. It was not over righteousness by faith. And that there were many, many, many early reformers. Early reformers. And most importantly, this whole thing started because of the Bible itself. So how precious is that book to you? Is it precious enough for you to read it every day? There's a reason why death came to anyone who had it. It's the word of life. 
It's the bread of life. It's Jesus in written form. Y'all have a good one.